Bird. Coming to you now quite live from Panda Studios, the Bad Year Workers production. I'm Sasha Senevic. With me is Brian O'Hawk. After a long absence from the airwaves. <laughs> but I know how have you been the past few weeks? All right. Okay. As far as like people wondering where were we, what have we done, are we still alive? Uh, like we always say in the show, this is something we do around our daily lives. So occasionally things happen that we have to get taken care of in our lives and with our actual jobs, which uh, causes us to sort of go to the background. But we always try to get back to it. And uh, so we're back. Okay. Yep. So today's topic. Alternative music sort of has this, uh, it serves as an umbrella label where a lot of people like, it has a lot of different sounds that stretch a lot of different bands that don't really fit together. I think though, if there's one band that you can totally define alternative music by, especially 90s alternative music, it's got to be Nine Inch Nails. Yes. And when you talk about Nine Inch Nails, you got to talk about like the one member of my, that really defines Nine Inch Nails because it's pretty much... A pseudonym for him, Trent. Yep, Trent, Trent Reznor. Reznor. Okay, so like, so Trent Reznor hit the scene like in 1989, pretty hate machine, for those who don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, it hit the scene, and it was a new sound. Now, we already talked about like the death of glam and how grunge came along around the, that exact same time, and sort yeah. of put the last nail in the coffin, and then this, what I would call the golden age of alternative music in the 90s hit that uh sort of killed everything 80s <laughs> wise but it also it it introduces new uh sound and rock music that had a west influence so we talked about the the influence that grunge had on that but uh, simultaneously nine inch nails you know with trent also sort of like a, developed a unique sound that wasn't influenced by grunge it wasn't part of grunge but it still also had just as much of an influence as far as like defining what 90s alternative music would sound like. And uh, so sort of like, I want to hit on that today. So sort of like talk about the, because I know a lot of times we sort of hit different uh, topics, but we're both all like this. I think this might be like the one genre that really had a huge influence on us personally. So that's why I think we can cover a lot of ground. Yeah. At least it did on me. I mean, I don't want to speak for you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I grew up listening to Nine Inch Nails and you know, Trent Reznor and and all that. I mean, that's that's what helped me get past the 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 hair metal in the late eighties before Nirvana. But you had to wait the one year. <laughs> yeah, you know. Before that, there was like just crap. Well, there was punk music was was around in the eighties too. Yeah, but I wasn't like I was exposed to it. Not really exposed to it. I was more around the. The stuff that was popular on like TV, mm-hmm. you know, and so yeah, I, was, well, I mean, yeah. Well, that's a, well, that's the thing, like, because uh, especially like as Trent was coming out, uh, a lot of bands in the eighties existed that had sort of like this newer sound where it was going for towers, but they were underground. They were sort of not in the mainstream. You had to sort of be within that. Uh, community in order to hear it and then like but it was through uh bands like you know like grunge was one thing that we talked about but also through nine inch nails that sort of hit the mainstream and got you know when he got his label deal uh originally went into scope then he had a huge falling out with them (laughs) but yeah i know he's with columbia now but uh, like originally like it had such a wide um, uh, mainstream success commercial success that it sort of May it open the door for all these other acts also to come, uh, sort of like to get more mainstream attention, yeah, yeah get a yeah. wider audience, sort of like, and that's why we became exposed to it. If they hadn't, we might not have heard it, and you know, who knows, Glam might still <laughs> have ruled the airwaves for <laughs> nah. another decade to come. Although, nah. I, I like to think the consumers just sort of got like whatever cocaine trip they were on in the 80s, <laughs> they finally yeah. woke up from it, and, yeah. and that's what killed it off. And it would have happened no matter what. But that's a story for another day. Oh, yeah. But, like, just focusing on him. Here's the interesting thing about him. He, in some ways, is sort of seen as the self-made musician. Because he, you know, he tried, he went through a couple of bands before. And he tried doing the, you know, like the usual thing where you join a band, you do gigs. And then eventually he produced a, an album, which he did. Uh, he worked as a... 
producer, quote unquote, yeah. but also as the janitor. <laughs> yeah. In there. And uh, he just asked to be able to do his own demo uh, on the when they weren't using the studios. And he sort of like influenced by Prince, who I know is a, you're a big fan of. Yeah. Uh, so like did all the instrumentals on his own, except I think like drums, he hired someone for that, but like essentially did all yeah, that, yeah, yeah. did all the sampling, did all the mixing, did everything and produced Pretty Hate Machine. Uh, essentially by himself. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think that's a lot, that's a big influence to a lot of people who are like are trying to get into the, who, in like a become musicians so or self made yeah, musicians. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I think that's like a good example of somebody that, uh, like, when you're that driven and that devoted to it, like, you sort of, and he did it with a sound that wasn't popular in a sense. And when I say popular, what I really mean is like, not, it, it was commercially risky territory that yeah, he, was, he, he, he was in. It, it wasn't a sound that was uh, known. Yeah, well, he did the whole industrial in, yeah, in thing, a way, so. like yeah, and he in a way he marketed that, like he put his stamp on that, yeah, uh, on that uh, on that particular song, because you know what a Nine Inch Nails song is, right? When you hear it, yeah, or at least I mean, like we do, <laughs> like uh, people who listen to the kind of music we do, oh yeah. Uh, so I think like that's really clever. One way it's risky because it it could have failed because it was still sort of glam, was still around even though it was dying, but for like the average consumer. They had no idea that within a year or two it was be completely gone. Yeah. Uh, so and also it all fell on him. If something wasn't good, I mean, it would be all on him. There's nobody else to blame. Yeah. As far as like their production, and then you know, like repeatedly, and he kept doing it. You know, it wasn't a one-off thing. He could have become a you know one-hit wonder, and then that could have been the end of it. But then some would say, you know, as the years went by, as he produced more music, it. It, he only proved that this was a genre and a style of music that was here to stay. Yeah. And yeah. that could have a long lasting appeal uh, through the generations. Cause right now it's a new generation that came out that's come out since. And it still has the same appeal cause he's still touring. He's still yeah, he, making he, money. And other bands have come out and still come out that are clearly influenced by the sound that he produced. Yeah. Well, the thing, I mean, the, that's the sound he started, you know, started off with and stuff is, Bigger overseas, you know, it's the industrial yeah, scene. Yeah, I don't mean like he a, invented it. it but no, it, no, no. But that's the thing. The industrial scene, it was not really hit here in, in, it wasn't know, in the known, States no. or whatever. And you know, over in Germany where everything is, <laughs> you know, it was, it's a big thing. It's been you know, around since like 70s or whatever. I mean, it's been around for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you know, Bowie, I think, even touched on it. Just it was a big, it was a big influence on Trent. Yeah, so... I mean, that's the thing is he, you know, Trent started something with something risky. He didn't go with the the hair metal. He didn't go with like the grunge stuff. He just kind of just industrial rock type thing, which is a different, you know, flavor in music, I guess. And it, it hit for him. So that's what he went with, you know, that's what's been working for him. Right. Although he has done a lot of different things. I mean, you know, he's, he's branched out now. But you know that's you know yeah, we'll, for later we'll, in the conversation. Well, yeah, we'll get into it because there are, of course, criticisms. There are too many criticisms that we're going to touch on in the course of this. But right now, I just want to sort of lay out yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, things about. Him. So, starting out, he will. He's somebody that's also famous for like all his collaborations. He's not scared to do. He's not afraid to do collaborations and mix his sounds yeah. with others. You know, he'll do film scores. Are another thing that he's uh, yeah, had yeah, a lot yeah. of a lot of uh, like he has a lot. Uh, discography that, that was just produced clear, solely for movies. Yeah. So, you know, like, and that, but, and a lot of people, you know, might probably hear, heard that this thing trend as a sound without even knowing it, just from like movies and yeah, yeah, things yeah. like that. Uh, I mean, there, there but, was. I mean, that's the thing like, is he, it's a different sound he does for scores right. than he does for Nine Inch Nails. So he does dis- uh, distinguish the two. I mean, yes, he has some of the same feel, but it's still a different sound. Because I mean, didn't he produce the whole Facebook, uh, the social network, social right? network, Ooh. also Gone Girl, and Gone Girl? Yeah, he did all the music for those. But yeah, yeah, he, he you, you clearly, don't really tell. Yeah, he has. I think that uh, he has a versatility to him when he when he feels it's appropriate. Yeah, to have it. He also produ- He also did some producer work with uh, Notorious B.I.G. Back in the 90s, 
back in the nineties, which is uh, not which isn't that common with yeah, yeah, somebody yeah. who's clearly in rock music. Yeah, and uh, in like a and um, like distinctly distinctly hip hop <laughs> artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which is one reason why Timberland uh, is a big fan of Trent Reznor. Yeah, like he he is on record as saying he's the best music producer that there is. And Trent, in addition to being a good musician, I think this is also what largely made his uh, early work so successful. It's like he's a very good, very meticulous producer. Yeah. Like he knows how to sound, how it's supposed to sound, how the tracks are supposed to flow into each other. Yeah. In a way that a lot of musicians don't. A lot of musicians, they might be very talented uh, songwriters, they might be very uh, talented instrumentalists, but when it comes to the aspect of uh, just putting it all together yeah, in a yeah, coherent yeah. package, Trent sort of just has an ear for that. Yeah, I mean, that's why you have producers and then you have musicians. You know, that's that's what they focus on. They don't just like do the music and be like, okay, this is how you play it. They arrange it. They, you know, kind of tweak it and make it sound better. Or, you know, they in a full track, they can kind of make it come, you know, come together correctly and not stand out as much. So yeah. yeah. And a lot and of Trent people does that. He, he has his, his two hats, three hats, whatever door he does the musician part, the producer part and everything else. Like, you know, a lot of musicians now are doing that because digital agents, a lot easier. It's made it a lot uh, easier for people. Cause you can, we do, okay. Think of it this way. We have a podcast that we host and we put out on our own. Yeah. 20 years ago, would we have had the, you know, before there was SoundCloud, YouTube, uh, iTunes, you know, like we, before we had such easy access to mediums, would we have been able to do that? Like it would have been a hell of a lot harder for oh, us. Yeah. Like you, it's not as simple as just, hey, you got a Gmail account, you can pretty much do any of these yeah. things. Like you, you got a, anything to record something on a microphone, you're done. Yeah, yeah. And so that's a webcam. You can pretty much get it done. So, but that's why like, for him to do that in the eighties. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, like it's something worth uh, giving uh, credit to. The other thing I always give him credit for is this. When uh, he had an issue, when he started having a real issue with Interscope, uh, he did this whole thing where he encouraged his fans to quote unquote, steal his music. Yeah. He encouraged them to go out there and just download the shit out of it. <laughs> like as much as they can. Uh, get, so that's the other thing. Like, in some ways, of course, he wants to make a living. Of course, he wants to make money. But it, I, and I felt like that uh, was cl it's cliche for a lot of musicians to say, I'm all about the music, man. I don't care about the yeah, money. Yeah, then yeah. Napster hits and it reveals that 90% of them are total bullshit artists when oh, it comes yeah. to that. They care about the money. I feel like with Trent, though, <laughs> when push comes to shove, he really does wants to get his music out. Yeah, I know yeah, someone's going to list some he, example where he, he, he wants to hit somebody. But, yeah. Yeah. So like, I, mean, I felt like more so than others, he does. The, and this is, let's get into a little bit of one criticism that I don't really think is a criticism, the, his reputation for being a perfectionist. Yeah. Like a, being very controlling when it comes to how the sound is supposed to be, uh, when it comes to being very demanding about how it's supposed to be. I'm paying uh, attention. That's, uh, yeah, I think that he gets criticized for that and a lot of people like it's, the personality comes on too strong. But I don't really think it's a bad thing to be a perfectionist, especially yeah, to yeah, have yeah. something that's so, let's say, delicate. But that's that's the thing is, if you're doing a you know your producer like record producer, and you're that's what you're doing, you have to be a perfectionist. So I mean that's that's the thing is you don't want someone who's going to be lazing around. It's kind of like hey, yeah, it sounds fine, you know, kind of whatever. It's like no, 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 we need to redo this again. It's just the sound's not coming out right. Something just not feeling right. Well, whatever. Especially, I mean, yeah, with him, it's he's doing all the work. He's doing a lot of the the you know playing on all, on the tracks. He you know re, he arranged the the songs. He wrote the songs. He's done everything on it. So yeah, he, it's his baby. He's going to be a little extra pushy on it, I guess. Mm. And so that you know, as as you're saying, um, it is something that you know <clears throat> it would be hard to work with somebody like that. But that's because they want to make sure it's coming out right and what's in their head, you know. Because yeah. I mean, he worked with tons of artists, mm -hmm. and I think the the tracks or the albums he worked with sound a lot better than what they did without him. Yeah, you know, like Manson. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know I like the stuff that he did with Trent Reznor, and then he went away from him, and it turned into crap. And then he kind of went back to that same feel kind of sound, but not with Trent that I know. Well, Manson is an interesting case and might be a good uh, case example for this because uh, the reason why they had sort of a professional split, if possibly even a personal split, is like uh, Manson's quote is saying they had to make a choice whether he wanted to keep a friendship or whether he wanted to. Uh, go out there and uh, succeed as much as he could because he sort of, sort of like implying that sort of Trent didn't want him to become more successful than him yeah and then he he himself was yeah instead of uh, like so there might like I don't know any of these people personally there might be that aspect to his personality yeah, yeah, yeah. like I'm not going to d- dismiss it or deny it or claim that it's not true or and you know and, I'm not, and I can't confirm it of course because again I don't know yeah you know like but I can see why that might be there. Like if he feels like, so like this is my protege and if he feels protective over his work, he might start feeling protective about everything he produces, even stuff for other artists. Yeah. <laughs> like, so he might sort of start getting the same sort of feel, which might rub some people the wrong way, especially the other artists. Cause they're like, okay, I hired you to be a producer, not be the creative, <laughs> you know, artistic brain behind my operation. Yeah. You know, like that, like I can see what, and a lot of times, and this is just like in any creative field in general, when you have two minds mixing, even ones who might agree on a particular style, you're going to run into conflict really easy. Oh, yeah. And this is why, you know, when you're in a band with somebody <laughs> and he doesn't have to deal with this because his band is essentially him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Nine Inch Nails has one key member. Yeah. All the other ones are kind of interchangeable. Like people all go on concerts and tour with him to play the instruments. Oh, yeah. So he's the only consistent member. But I mean, like in other bands, like you, a lot of times they fall apart and they break up because they're going to, there will be creative differences. There is usually one person that takes the lead when it comes to creative decisions. And it just, it works fine if the other people remain passive about it. If they just don't care, like they're like, fine, this is just not, I'm just going to do my part and I deal with it. Yeah. Uh, it's rare that I see any band work out where it's sort of like everybody has an equal say in everything creatively. Usually there's a leading force behind, <laughs> behind all of that. Just my experience from what I've seen. Like, <laughs> and uh, whether or not you like the bands are in democracies for the most part. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they're usually like they Let's say some form of autocratic rule is happening. There's a, usually somebody has a stronger personality than every, and than anybody else, and the others are just sort of following along with that. Yeah, you know, and it can tear up a bit. I'm pretty damn sure Guns N' Roses broke apart because Axl Rose is a he's a shitty leader and kind of a shitty musician. <laughs> yeah, just you know, yeah. my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's a shitty leader and a shitty. Like, he might have some of that uh, in, like, Dominus that worked for a while, but eventually everybody else just started yeah, they, pushed everybody they away. Own, own and, it, and it happens to a lot of bands. Now, Trent, again, Trent doesn't have to deal with that. Because he's, yeah, he <laughs> Cause it's has just a new him. batch of yeah, like, So that's things. why I was always so interested, like, in Nine Inch Nails, like, uh, just logistically how that works out so yeah. wonderfully for him, where it's like, he doesn't have to consult with anybody when it comes to that. Now, yeah. there are times when he does have to consult with stuff like the record labels, that's where he came into conflict like uh, I mean let's just talk about his big split with Interscope for a while and he had in, in the, his own indie label yeah. and now he's again with the mainstream label Columbia Records the reason he said is while he enjoys having the creative control and all of that everything that comes along with that when it comes to marketing it is so much easier to have a label yeah, yeah. You. when you have a bag a big, I mean like as far as like just promotion you, just easier. to get yeah just to get your name out there just to get a, yeah. all the promotional things out there but I mean, it's that, so much that's, easier to have a label that's the thing is even if you become you know a bigger musician a known artist like mm-hmm. Nine Inch Nails Trent Reznor if you have your own label like Nothing Records it's like you're the, you're everything to do with it but it's your business you have to take care of so yeah, marketing. If you don't have the backers or the the people, then you that's something mm-hmm. you have to go out and hire people and just deal with. And it's more people to deal with. And if that's not what you do, you know, you're a musician, you're a producer. It's just what you focus on. It's kind of you know, it's it takes away from that creative process. 
So it is always good to have a, a <clears throat> bigger name or bigger label uh, behind you to do well, a whole to do just to just you know, do just, that no, no, you. no, it's good to have just a bigger label behind you just to do that alone. I mean, if they do absolutely nothing else but just to have the department to do all the the you know promotional stuff, and you have a team of lawyers that you know you can call on if you have to, and it's nothing that you really have to worry about. It's like, okay, I'm here. This is what I'm doing. You know, it's a subgroup to your label at the moment or whatever it is. You know, we'll go from there. And you know, I do something, you guys promote it, so I don't have to go out of my way. You know, and you know, take time away from the creative process mm-hmm. to, you know, do this marketing or do this legal mumbo jumbo and all this other stuff. It's, so yeah, it's a it's a funny thing because the sort of that's the sort of crowds we would, I mean, like the indie scene and the indie labels are heavily glamorized and promoted. Like you got to be indie, you go indie. That's how you yeah. stay true. You keep your heart. But in a lot of you know, like you, and we've done it ourselves. You know, like you shit on you know, like all the negative aspects that come along with having a yeah, yeah, mainstream yeah. label backing you. But there are clearly benefits that come yeah. along with that. And, the, the, and uh, the thing is, like when you expect all the positive and the non negatives, you're being a little bit unrealistic because the labels have their end goals too. Yeah, it's to make money, so they they will micromanage you yeah, a bit in order to get to that end goal. The, the thing yeah. is, indie labels nowadays aren't really indie. They're smaller subset of a bigger group, and it's just they say they're an independent label, but they have you know mm-hmm. you know bigger backers. They have a bigger label that's you know owns mm-hmm. them. They just don't really yeah go with them. They're like a subsidiary. Yeah, of, and it's like oh uh, yeah, and it was an indie, indie label here and there. It's like yeah, but if you follow them back, they're like you know connected to Sony Records okay. or something. Yeah, truly independent label is like there's a group of people that have a band and they just, everything that they put out, they put under a name that they made up yeah, <laughs> for, the, it's for like, themselves and they're just putting it out these days out through social media. I mean, like you, if you want yeah. like the purest of the pure. Yeah, it, it's like labels. what I have. You know, yeah. Bad Year Records. Bad Year Records. That's, a, that's a truly independent Yeah, you're not backed label. by anybody. I'm not backed by anybody. <laughs> that's why you don't hear it out in the, yeah, but you know, whatever. Like it's, that, it's but you will, the problem is, that's what I have. if you're that low on that level, like if you define indie that strictly, which is what the industry doesn't define indie that strictly. They would call those subsidiary or subsidiary of a bigger yeah, yeah. label an indie label because it's not... It's like a there's a middleman between them and the other guys. Like it's yeah. not directly linked to it. Yeah. So like they would, as far as like what they would call something like bad year records or anything else, it's like so far out there. Like it's so small of a thing. Not to insult you or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, like no. a like a you're drowned out by all the other ones. Watch it now. <laughs> it's my label. Here. No I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, like you get drowned out. I mean, like the same thing if, when if, you. If it wasn't for my label, this podcast wouldn't be hap- happening. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. I'm pretty sure it's the mix and the mics <laughs> that are making that Shut up. possible. Oh. Shut up! Yeah, you, you you can thank uh, iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> which is Google, which is a corporation. Yeah, just saying. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, so, but because uh, it would suck to have to put these all on CD and mail it out to random oh, but people. You got, like you're like the guy. You remember? <laughs> I don't know if they still do that. Like. They in the neighborhoods I live. There's usually a guy like in uh in Houston. They always hit this the stop and go, which is Houston's answer to the Seven Elevens, which you don't have there. Yeah. <laughs> like there always some guy with like a burnt CD that used to be like you know, I was like, hey man, check this out. You know, like take a look at it. You can look at my Geo City site. <laughs> yeah, I know Geo City doesn't exist anymore, but yeah, yeah, in the yeah, early two yeah. thousands, they're like, yeah, go to my Geo City site, geocities dot com backslash <laughs> like backslash uh, uh the funk man. Backlash, <laughs> yeah, six seven nine ten nine dot com. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, those were always fun. Yeah, yeah. That's, you you that's take it, the... you take it just to get them to go away, and then it's like you get the disc, and like it skips like crazy. <laughs> you throw it away or whatever you do. Yeah, yeah. You or you burn over it <laughs> if it's rewritable. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but it, anyway, the point I was trying to make is like, look, it's like being in a garage band. <laughs> And uh, trying to get like a, and playing like maybe you get like some two minute spot in some dive bar somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, as a, and compare you and compare to like even uh, you know a lot of people say like an indie band like Pennywise or something. Yeah, indie. 
Uh, yeah. But they're a lot more well known than any of the no names. Oh yeah, that are yeah. out there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's the thing. Is I mean, with it's, so label it's, labels, it's a, a big help label is what help. I'm trying to say. Like, yeah, having like, having a label that has backing helps you get heard, you know, things like that. And I mean, it it sucks, I guess, because uh, there's so many horror horror stories out there of like indie label or not an indie label, but big label screwing uh, bands over because. They're just not relevant anymore, or whatever. And then they, you know, hear those whatever, you know, the horror stories like, "Oh, these this label sucks. You should never go with them. You know, don't go with big labels because of, you know, whatever." And it's yeah, but there's also a crap load of indie labels or you know, independent people that we've never heard of them because it gets no further than their garage. Yeah, you know? or the YouTube channel or YouTube, yes. But that's the thing is, I mean, like Trent Reznor, he. Started off with his own little thing, kind of, you know, got heard and produced his one thing, probably found an indie label, got bigger to, to a bigger well, label. Well, I mean, he was Interscope. been into school pretty quickly Yeah, when he started out. Yeah, but I mean, he started off kind of, you know, you yeah. know his own, what but helped he, him? he got big you know, in that sense, and that, you know, it, it's a sound and everything helped him out and everything yeah. else. And what helped him, he also, he worked within the music yeah. industry, you know, in yeah. a sense, tangentially, but he was in it. Yeah, yeah. So he, it's not like worked, he didn't yeah. know anybody. Yeah, but that's, I mean, he, he had to branch out that way, and yes, and then you had your your problems with your major labels, and you go to independent, and now he's like, well, I'll go back with the major label, but that's just because... But with a different uh, one, because well, the yeah. other guys suck. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, a, you know, but there's a different reason for it, it's just because he wants to spend more time doing his music thing, and yeah. not the business aspect of it, which, you know, yeah. Makes sense. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, but and that's, that's, that's the thing, is it's, you know, he's such a talented guy like you know musician mm-hmm. producer all that that you you know don't really want him to like okay well no focus just on the business side of it you know mm-hmm. and look and the bigger the bigger you get the more the business side and the marketing side takes a front seat yeah or an equal amount of share of your time because the bigger you are the more you have to concern yourself with all that because you have more money flowing in and out into everything that you're doing yeah. And so you need to keep track of that. The smaller you are, the less you really have to think about that. You know, it's like, well, if you're like really small, like garage level small, it's like the posters you spend in Kinko's is what it used to be. Or the amount of time you spend on Twitter or social media, I guess yeah, it's yeah, equivalent yeah. You, now. You, I'm still stuck in my own time. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's the, the time you spent, you know, painting every little sign, you know, it would, you know, by hand or well, writing it out days, with the they, marker. It's Photoshop. No, no, no. no, no. Yeah, just, I'm talking about old school. It's just well, yeah, back in the that. day. But, we but were, like, it's the time you spent doing that, and then and you, you sell it every back freaking, your trunk. you know, every uh, uh, you know light post you can get to, and you staple it onto the thing, saying a show coming up at whatever place, and you try to gather people, and you have a little secret show, or yeah, and whatever, it's like six you know, stuff show like up. that, <laughs> and you and you enjoy the ten seconds of chaos that you have, yeah. You know, but yeah, but that's a whole different thing. That's independent. That's truly independent compared to the you well, know, and that's the thing. 30, and that's the thing that gets dollars, and that's the thing that gets glamour. Fans, and that's the thing that gets glamorous. And what's disheartening, though, in this whole story is, uh, if Nine Inch Nails, which was already huge, yeah, at the point when he had that issue with Interscope and broke apart and did his own thing and had trouble with that, if someone like Nine Inch Nails, with you know all the fame that he already has couldn't like still had issues with that man is that disheartening to the smaller guy oh yeah <laughs> like as far as like because if he with all the resources that he has had yeah. trouble making it work yeah man you're gonna have a hard time yeah but that's that's, and a, being that's as the thing as talented if, as he is too. if you focus on like if like trent he's a musician when he does this producing thing he does producing but he's a musician. That's what he does. He, you don't want to spend your time away from cr- the creative process when you're having to, you know, run the business of, you know, meetings and and you know, merchandising and all that stuff. And you're just like, well, this is not dealing with what I need to do. I need to get out the new music. I have stuff in my head. You know, you're taking away from it. And so that's the whole thing. Is I think the big problem there with anyone running their own label who's a bigger band. You know, when you're independent and you're on your own, then yeah. I mean, you go into the studio or you record when you can, when you're inspired, you do your thing, you're not like on a schedule. And then from there, you're like, okay, well, you know, Facebook, Twitter, you know, Instagram, you know, go to any 
bar you can. It's like, hey man, let me you know, I got a band, let's kind of play, give you a little quick, you know, whatever, you know, this and that. Or here, I, have, I know, yeah, you know, see you guys having a show coming up. Can I jump on as like your opening act? You know, things like that. That's just what you do until you get bigger or known or heard or whatever. Mm-hmm. But that's the, it's the life of the independent and the smaller groups and stuff it's, like that. When you get bigger, like Nine Inch Nails and Trent Reznor, you have to deal with everyone saying, hey, when's your next album? Hey, when's your next album? Hey, when's this? What's this doing? Here's saying We need you to produce right. this, do that. Do that. And you have all these people and you're like, well, screw that. I just want to go do my thing well, to have someone else take care of yeah, it. Yeah, and I mean, he, he famously, <laughs> probably, and possibly, I mean, the stress also yeah. went along with this. So maybe just this, this sort of... Uh, Obsessive personality and perfectionist. I mean, he had substance abuse issues and all that through a time period when he went through all that. Yeah. Uh, you know, when all this was like crashing in the middle of his career when he was sort of like the top of his fame and he had to step away from it for a while. Yeah. And just because it was, uh, you know, I think probably because it was getting a little too intense, I think I've heard him comment on it, although he doesn't really want to talk about it as much anymore these days because, you know, you probably kind of get tired of repeating the same damn stories. Oh, yeah. So... Now that we've laid out all this much, uh, I want to talk about a more serious music-wise criticism that people put through. And I think it's one that, you know, deserves some level of consideration. Yeah. So even though when he first came out, the sound was risky and new and innovative, yeah. you know, could sort of, in a way, help define certain aspects of the alternative genre. Since it's come out, he hasn't updated much of his sound. Yeah. And so, like, even though, like, he's played around when he does other things, like, you know, whether he's helping, you know, do branching into a little bit of hip-hop here, whether he's in, like, helping another artist to put together something over there or doing a music score or something like, I mean, yeah. a movie score. The Nine Inch Nails releases, album after album after album, are really different variations of the same sound and but and not much of a different variation yeah. so it's one big album dawning all the way back to the beginning one we already mentioned pretty hate machine yeah do you do you think that's a legitimate point to make do you think that it's a criticism do you think it's even it doesn't matter as a criticism it's something you? we've discussed quite a few times in a couple of different podcasts yeah we mentioned you, know, that you now need now. to you know as a artist you should uh, evolve you know to mm-hmm. something but don't try to go completely away from what your fans know mm-hmm. you know don't be like you know I don't even know there's too many damn bands like Metallica you know the <laughs> bunch, the, of, bunch of freaking bad example bad, for you. no 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 really just they're horrible they're a bad bad freaking band each and every one of them are assholes they're all money grubbers and, and all that but they changed their sound yeah. from what they used to sound like in the like, black album and, the black album and all that. They Absolutely. changed their sound, and now you you listen to the lost fans. like yeah no that. But I mean you you listen to their older stuff back in the eighties, black album before the black album, whatever all that, and then you listen Rest to like, puppets, things like that. Uh, yeah you, you listen to like Reloaded, which was like fans didn't want to download it because it was horrible. Saint Anger, you know, Saint Anger, all that. They changed their sound. The singer started singing different. They got a new bassist to. You know, change the whole sound of the band, things like that. I hate the band. You know, if anyone's heard for this those podcast, of you who are not aware, they would know. Oh, hold on, for those of you who are not aware, it is your personal thing. We have a Saints of Last My Drinking Game. There are two things that happen when Brian starts going on the about how much Metallica sucks. You take a shot, and also when he starts talking about how much he hates Donald Trump, you take a shot. It has to happen organically. You yes. can't shoehorn it into a conversation. So right now, <laughs> take a shot. Yes, okay, but like go. like I said. So, yes, they try to change their sound to get fans, lose fans, whatever. And they, I think they just sucked in general as it is. So they didn't have to change anything. But Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails, he started off with this pretty hate machine, same sound. Mm-hmm. He's evolved it slightly, but he hasn't done like a really big change. I mean, there's some songs um, that I don't think sound like the typical Nine Inch Nails song. But yet, works for the album that does like fit in the, the same sound. Like if you listen to one album all the way through, or just a couple different albums all the way through, you'll find a few songs in each album that are slightly different or just completely different than the the sound you're used to. But they're not as well known. Like you know, they're not major hits in a sense because 
it's just not what people expect from Nine Inch Nails, you know. So that's the thing is he's he's evolved enough to in his sound to where it's not noticeable to be a big difference from like you know Saint you know, or what is it the uh, Master Puppets and you know Reloaded mm-hmm. Metallica you know two there's completely different sounds completely different things like ugh, going into corn they started off you know kind of that you know more of a rock thing had a little bit of rap in there and then they did the the you know what's new metal called? face new metal face well they did it really like oh, later they on they death. really messed with it they uh, the song i hate twisted transistor really hate it you know whatever the open door that album yeah. yeah i really hate that but anyways and then the and, then, and then they and then they messed around they did a dubstep thing I personally like it. Not a lot of people do. I don't think. I just don't like dubstep. But I, I kind of—they really got a little bit heavier. They added the dubstep feel to it and stuff, and they've changed completely. But then they still have their old sound too. So they've kind of evolved both. You know. And so they have that little thing. But that's the thing: is Nine Inch Nails. I mean, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I think they have evolved slightly throughout the years enough to have kind of the same sound, but still be, you know, different. I don't know. Well, two things for me. Now, one, it's it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't thing. Because if you don't evolve your sound through the years, then you become stale. You're boring. You're one trick pony. If you if you do evolve your sound, uh, or change it up, or mix it up, or try to be risky with it, then you're a sellout. Who's trying? Especially if it becomes even a little bit popular, then you're a sellout, or you you can't reproduce what what you did last time. You know, Manson. it was it was a one off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's that's kind of the problem. So it's like you you'll never satisfy everybody with it. Yeah. Now, in in some ways, like or or yeah, you like get the, it's a you, weird balance to hit because sometimes it's a very fine line. Yeah. Or you get the, the, the change, but it's not a bad change. Just people don't like it. Black Flag. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Black Flag. It's not much. It's just, the band, mm. like, the rock sound, I think, is as good as the punk sound. Yeah. But the punk fans, and I've said this before, and I'll we say it, the, the most <laughs> conservative, conformist, non-conformist are people in the punk scene. And I say that as someone who was in the punk scene. Yes. Like, the most rigid do not t- get off my lawn <laughs> people yeah. even though they hate that mentality of people in the punk because they just any anything they celebrate the non-conformity to the point where it's like dogma <laughs> yeah and anything that goes differently it, or it tries to intrude a little bit in it they sort of attack <laughs> yep. it, 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 like the inquisition so that <laughs> and that's one reason why I sort of why I started stepping yeah, away yeah, from because yeah. I started seeing that yeah. so I think that's why punk is a whole different animal yeah, when it yeah. comes to these sort of conversations but yeah but uh going back to my point like it's a very odd balance to hit where you're gonna you're gonna lose look you're gonna lose people in general at some point people's tastes also change over time you know the stuff you find interesting at 18 you might not like at 38 even if the musician is still around you know maybe you like Danish nails when you were 18 you know by the time you hit 42 you're like Okay, it's just not my jam anymore. Yeah. I, just, I can't relate to this anymore. Like, yeah. uh, it's, I think Limbiscuit probably suffered a lot of that. A lot of their, so like, uh, the younger teenage angst people kind of grew up and got jobs. They're like, okay, I can't relate to this anymore. So yeah. I'm going to move on. And they didn't get any new fans after that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, the second point I was trying to make is, you know, aside of the damned if you do, damned if you don't. So you, I don't think you should worry too much about that. As far as like changing up your sound, if you're going to stay relevant in some ways, you're going to change your sound no matter what. Now, I think with Nine Inch Nails, though, the change that we might be hearing could be that he's gotten better at making music. Yeah. All time. So it sounds cleaner. Yeah. It sounds better. Of course, the equipment also got better. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, like, a, it's, it's just a, he's, you know... When you do something long enough, you get a certain echo of what works, what doesn't. You, the trial and error you went through to the first few albums, you sort of polish up a cleanup. And I think his later albums are a lot cleaner in that sense. Yeah. Where, you know, like in the first one, you see that is one off tracks. It's, you could tell it's his music, but they don't really flow like the other ones. You know, like you got yeah. three tracks that really flow together. Then there's one, like, okay, he's trying something new here. Whereas later on, 
it's much more well choreographed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, at least I feel. Yeah. Like, uh, where the tracks are sort of flowing into each other better. So I think yeah. he's just getting the change and evolution. You see, just him getting better at it. Yeah. But now, he's found a niche that he fits into. Yeah. And it works and it still sells and he still has fans. I'm still a fan. You know, yeah. and I can, I think, I don't think it's an insult for me to recognize that he has a distinct sound and he stays to that sound. But I think that it's appealing enough, melodic enough, intriguing enough that I, I don't really want him to change it yeah. to the point. Like, I don't want him to do something totally different because it would no longer be Nine Inch Nails. And I'm not trying to be a purist where I'm like, oh, how dare you change the music I loved as a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, like, it would no longer be what he does. Like, I would be suspicious of it yeah. in some but sense. But here, here's the thing. is Like I said, he's he's evolved slightly throughout his whole career. Mm-hmm. If you listen to, you know, Pretty Hate Machine, The Downward Spiral, Further Down the you know, Spiral, yeah, Broken, all those stuff, mark and everything. Uh, you listen to all those, it's more aggressive. I think it, it's a little more aggressive. He has more to say in that sense, a little more, you know, against authority in a sense. Not really, but, you know, that type of thing. And then you listen to uh, Hesitation Mark and you go a little bit, it was more, uh, you know, all the recent stuff. I think it's actually more mellow. I think he's mellowed out quite a bit. With his his sound, it's mm-hmm. and that's the thing is he went for that more really aggressive kind of has that same feel still to this day, but he went from that really aggressive to the more it's mellow sound, stuff. So it's more like you know he's aged and you can tell. Mature, it's not, yeah, it's more mature. It's, it's more mature. whatever. So it, it it works with the with the ages. Like as a young, you're you're young adult or you're just young. You're like really aggressive. Like yeah, you know, in your face. Fuck it though. And then you get older and you're like, yeah, no, nah, just be a little mellow out a little bit. You know, I still, understand it, but nah, just mellow a little bit more. Fuck authority with a lowercase f. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, so, all that's, that's the thing is Nine Inch Nails is, it, you know, he's doing that. Not Trent Reznor. <laughs> you know, if you go from his very first album to his latest one, You'll see it more aggressive and kind of gets you know softer along the way, but it's not like completely soft. Man, he does mm-hmm. still have some of those tracks in there that are you know a little more aggressive, a little more you know to you know in your face in a, in a sense. You know, not not to be like oh no, it's like punk. You know, punk in your face. No, it's like you know, it's more yeah. You know, and that's and this is where, in your face. And that's so. what I said. Like this is like <laughs> so like it had a big influence in defining alternative because like so like alternative. You know, everything from freaking sublime. To Limbiscuit, to Fred Durst, <laughs> to Oasis. They were all lumped into alternative at one point. Yeah. They don't sound the same. Yeah. yeah Whereas, yeah. like, Nine Inch Nails, distinctly, if you're going to describe it as one thing, you know, you can say industrial rock, you can say whatever, but alternative kind of covers yeah. it <laughs> really yeah. well to, in like a, to lump it all in there. Yeah. In like a, and uh, that's why, like, we'll probably have a, its own topic at some point. Like, I think the 90s was the golden age for this kind of music and it was the golden age of music in general. You know, for all the old timers who keep saying that the 70s and the 60s had the best music, I think they were all just way too stoned <laughs> to notice what came afterwards. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, people like to shit on our millennial generation when it comes to musical taste. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, like, uh, it, it's just... Uh, I think it's it's just an it's an interesting debate when it comes to like the whole versatility thing and the change, uh, a thing where people are like like well I want my artist to be you know like to remain the artist that I knew, but I want the artist to also you know give me something new and challenge me a little bit, but and I I don't know how honest either crowd is really with the position that they have because you will walk away from an artist that you feel got stale. Yeah, and but you will also turn away from knowledge that you feel becomes a different person every yeah, single yeah, album because yeah, yeah. yeah, you can't keep track completely. of that. Like yeah. if uh, you know, if uh, Insane Clown Posse suddenly came out with a poker <laughs> album, I, I'm pretty sure their I, parents I think their will family be, will follow. <laughs> they'll follow all of They'll abandon. The, what if they abandon the makeup when they do it? I don't know. They may or may not follow on that one. Well, Kiss took off the makeup for a while, and everyone hated it. <laughs> so no, put it back on. Do you only want to look at Gene Simmons without his makeup on? No. I mean, he's no. not a he's not a good looking guy. No, he's not. In fact, none of them really. But, you know, they, they didn't they didn't get known for their looks. They got known for their shitty disco for, music for their disco music. The shitty disco music. Yeah. Look, they got known for it was the image, and this is I think our very first topic on this podcast ever: image versus musicianship. Other than. 
I want to work on all, all night and party every day, which is the only thing anyone knows about, because name any other song. Name one other song. Yeah. And I know people might be Googling this, and they're going to be like, no, oh, I, this, this, this. No, no, no. The average listener, name one other song yeah. that you know about, because just on top of your head. You probably don't. But without Googling it. But that's the thing is, if you grew up it's at the, the time. Image. You know the image. If you grew up at the time, you would know some songs. I don't even think they, you know, people they, in the they, time that's the thing. They would know some songs if you're around the same time that, you know, they were big, re- relevant. Now, yeah. And it was like, what, who did that song? Who were they? The thing that lasted was the image. They had a very memorable image. Yeah. Now, the thing about, uh, uh in, in a cat. Yeah. In contrast to Nine Inch Nails, is like a lot of people, they might not even know what the hell trend looks like. <laughs> yeah. But you know the sound. It's the sound that you recognize. I think that's yeah. a different when uh, people ask like when customer musicianship. Well, how do I, you know, tell distinguish between talent to somebody that just sort of is famous, yeah. a famous musician? It's image versus sound. If I can recognize your music without even seeing you, that's musicianship to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I just know you by look alone, but your song sounds interchangeable with everything else not yeah. interchangeable with the other songs you made but interchangeable with like anything else that comes out on the radio that's when in my opinion you need to step up your game a little bit yeah and like not that you have to I don't care whether you do or not but like just in order for me to elevate you in my opinion yeah whether but you that care means, about it or not that's the thing so there is that that problem with the image versus the actual musicianship uh, you know the, the sound um, you go back to Manson started off his image, yeah. you know, that's what everyone's, so, it was, it's a shock rock. You see him, he's like, oh, that's Manson. But you hear his music and you're like, oh, that's Manson. You know? Well, he's and an to interesting this day, case because it's still kind of the same. He has, well, he's somebody who sort of, bal- like in some sense, like he balanced it too. Like he mixed the sound with whatever image he had at the time. Even Mechanical Animals, which you know is unpopular yeah. amongst Manson fans. The image he produced for it, though, was mm-hmm. very iconic and memorable to the sound that he yeah. produced. Yeah. So, like, it was a, visually, artistically, it was a good mishmash, whatever yeah. you might think of the songs themselves. Yeah. Uh, so, like, it, but for a lot of musicians' sound, like, Nirvana had a very distinct sound. Yeah. And, you know, like, originally the image didn't matter, but eventually the image also became something iconic and influential. Yeah. And I think a lot of ways, Kurt Cobain, I mean, you might disagree with dislike that. Yes. When the image started sort of overta- overtaking the sound, yeah. uh, he sort of had a hostile reaction to that. Yeah, that, that, that's one thing that I think is kind of like weird. It's been debated, you know, people say it was like, no, he didn't actually hate the fact that people liked his music and, and that he became famous. It's just, you know, it's an image that he gave. And it was like, I think he actually did kind of dislike the fact of being famous because it brought things that he didn't want. Like things he didn't expect. Everyone wants to be famous. That's the thing. No I think matter, originally he I, would I, want to. I mean, he was probably the thing is, wanted it. No, no matter first. who you are and how much you may say you don't want to be famous, you want to be famous. You want to be known. You want to get the the you know the knowledge and the uh, uh, the acknowledgement, not knowledge, because not really being famous knows knowledge or anything, but the acknowledgement of of whatever you're doing and you, you know the fame, the, praise, the money, you know all that stuff. You want that. Everyone wants it. It's just when you get it, most people will be like, "Oh, never mind. That's too much stress." There's a negative, and, and so that's the thing. Is I think that's what it was. Is you know, Kurt wanted to be famous, known, and like he wanted his music to be known. But him himself, I don't think he wanted the fame and I that spotlight. He just wanted like as a group of the band and, and his, once, his his sound. I think once he got there, it became overwhelming for him, especially with all his inner demons and all the uh, yeah. personal addictions and everything else that he had yeah, going yeah. on. It probably became eventually more than he can hand, yeah. handle. Yeah, but that's, a, that's uh, the thing. is I, I, it, Like I said, it, it's been debated. You know, I've heard right. people debate I on think it. to some extent, though, of course, uh, at first, you know, like he wanted to be get signed on to like what he wanted to. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, like... I mean, if you read the, the diary he had, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, we're having a meeting with this guy. Oh, well, this guy didn't work or well, whatever. Yeah, and then we'd write angry notes saying, like, look, just tell us whatever we can be in your label or not or tell us to fuck off so we can go somewhere else. Yeah. And, like, so he was... Uh, they were shopping around. You know, and, of course, look, anyone who tells me if you're trying to get into an artistic field, you can become an accountant and you can play your music in your basement and just for yourself and no one ever has to hear it. You have your music... 
you know, to work. But that's you really not wanting to be famous and not. Yeah. Know. Same thing with painting. You can paint in your garage and just go, you know, work an office job. Like, and no one will ever know you have it for yourself. Yeah. That's really, if you, if that's all you care about, that's what you would do. And that's what a lot of people do. Yeah. The people who step out and try to make a living off of it and yeah, a career yeah, yeah. off of it, of course, you want some acknowledgement. Yeah. But with, <laughs> in it, you want some, at least recognition within an industry. You want to make a mark for yourself. Yeah. And you want to make a living off, off it, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. too. And that's, that's the thing is, like I said, I think, and I personally think everyone wants to be famous, but not in that same sense. Like they just want to have the acknowledgement of, on mm-hmm. something, anything, but not necessarily is like, oh, they want all the fame and fortune and blah, 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 and the stress and all that. Like I said, you know, be, you know, you want to become an accountant and then you want to be, you know, play your own music in your, in your, Whatever, right. but as an accountant, you want to be known because you're that's getting right. your business. You don't want to be just some Joe Schmo. Who's like, oh, well, oh, there's an accountant. Oh, there's another accountant. You know, well, I was like, no, be- you want to go to this person because you know they'll take care of you. And I'm not saying famous and it's like, oh, lights and fame and like everyone knows you. It's famous in a sense is just being known. Look, nobody you know? within yeah within the within a small circle that you're working with nobody even I mean everyone knows the mediocre worker everyone knows yeah nobody strives to be the mediocre worker yeah. everybody wants to be some base level competent yeah at what they do and everyone feels good when they get some level of recognition now, yeah, yeah of course you know there are varying levels of success and varying levels of competency like we can get into that everyone knows the worker that's just not good at yes. their job and you might be that guy <laughs> in, yeah. some, in some sense you know if, if you're listening with it and but a lot of times you don't recognize whether you're the guy or not I yeah. Mean, yeah, yeah again because yeah. i don't i really don't think anyone wakes up and says well i'm gonna be really mediocre and incompetent yeah. today and the people who do recognize that are usually the ones who fall into deep depression oh, <laughs> or yeah. where, where their life is uh, has gone but that's why like uh with something like uh music or trying to do a creative thing like it's it's risky to put yourself out there because it's one thing to be an accountant and uh, you're schooling and uh, you know just uh, the recognition you get kind of is sort of what, what backs up your work you know you go you have a calculator you go through the numbers and the numbers are the same you're working with something really objective yeah when you're doing something art- artistic when you're doing uh, music when you're doing painting but let's just stick with music at the moment uh you're putting something out there yep. and it's vulnerable in some ways because you're putting something out there that you made and people are going to like it. People are going to hate it. People are going to be indifferent to it. Yeah. You want more people to like it than uh, hate it, but you definitely don't want people to be indifferent to it. You know, like even if you want more people hating it than you want people to be indifferent to it, because yeah. if you're indifferent, you're going to be forgotten much quicker. Oh yeah. So yeah. it's a, it's a much more delicate thing to go into in, in some ways it's a it's a brave thing to pursue i know a lot of people who get into this field are so seen as you're a slacker you don't want to get a real job the ones who become successful put a lot of work into it i mean Trent oh, yeah. is a testament to that oh, especially because yeah. he does so much on yeah. his own as yeah. far as that goes and i'm not saying there aren't sl- slackers and loafers and mooches oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. who are in there you know the guy that perpetually sleeps on your couch and all he's like i got a gig that's coming up and then like in a gig is never false yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. and they refuse to get a real you know, yeah, yeah, an actual yeah. date job yeah they they don't bring in a check right. of any but sort. i said like to the people who sit down and do this i think some level of recognition should be made about the fact they're doing something that they love and they're gonna they they're putting themselves out there yeah. in a way that a lot of people don't want to. A lot of people, you play it safe by taking you know, the day job and then that's yeah. it. And, that, the, and you live a, going, as going, comfortable life as you can. Going with that and saying, you know, doing the thing you love. I mean, as you stated before, you know, Trent has a, a moniker or whatever being hard to work with. Mm-hmm. And that's because he's doing something he loves. You know, he takes he, it serious. He's, he's, he, yeah, he takes it real serious. He knows what he... You know what he you know wants to do. He knows the sound. He knows all that stuff. He already has it in his head. If you try to give him a suggestion, he may or may not take it. You yeah. know, he's like, well, no, that's not the sound. That's not the the way I'm trying to go. You know, that's why he's hard to work with because he's stubborn in the sense of of that like, he wants to go in the way he already has it in his head, which is what a lot of musicians do. I mean, you have those musicians that are just assholes. You know, want to have a party and and do all that stuff and just that's it. They don't want, you know, they're not 
taking it serious. They just want the the fame, fortune, girls, drugs. Well, you know, well, that I mean, stuff. And also, what you were touching on, there's a difference, I think, between having a vision yeah. and being passionate about it yeah. and being a hardhead when it comes to yeah. things. Like, if you uh, if you refuse to listen to where things are, you know, the direction the music is taking, like all the people, let's go back to glam, all the people that still thought they could make glam work in 1990, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. when it was clearly dying, uh, they just weren't listening. Yeah. To where the, now, with something like Trent, they might say, like, well, you know, like his music uh, has remained relatively the same. Yeah, but the output, uh, I mean, the interest is still there for that kind of music. Yeah. It's like the audience hasn't left. And in fact, since it's, since it spawned such a wide, you know, alternative industrial rock uh, genre, you know, later on that still come, you know, producers bands to this day that start out yeah. trying to emulate that sound. It just shows that it has a lasting uh, capacity in a way. Like, so why, why would you want to turn your back to that whole community that enjoys that music? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, and that's that would be. I think uh, that's one thing that people need to address the ones who sort of go down as criticism and again I don't want to dismiss this criticism because I think it's an interesting one that people bring up so I'm not totally dismissing it I'm not trying to you know like beat it down or anything but I think there's something to be said about uh, understanding that uh, once a community forms that enjoys the music that you're putting out yeah you do feel a sense of responsibility to give them you know what they like yeah and uh, you know, like, to continue to give it, because there will be imitations of you, and there are many imi- Nine Inch Nails and imitations that try to emulate the sound that fail. And if you don't give them the real, you know, like if Chant doesn't produce the authentic Nine Inch Nails sounds, they're gonna get it from bands that are not as good. Yeah, yeah and then yeah. they might be turned off from it completely. Yeah, but that, I mean, that's the other thing is, I mean, I think you know, Trent did a good job in showing the versatility he can do without putting it under the, the one band like nine inch nails. I mean, we talked about it earlier that he did uh, like a social network. He actually won a, what is it? The Grammy or whatever for that, you know, for that thing It's what he did. And it wasn't the same sound as what normally is. Right. And you know, I mean, at least, he, at least from my understanding, because I personally have never seen it, so I don't have really have heard any of the music. I mean, I've but seen I've been it, told but that. I've seen it, but uh, yeah, the the music was the score was very good. It was very subtle and it flowed very well. Yeah, and with so the, that's like the thing. you don't even, in some sense, like once it's pointed out, you notice it. But like, yeah, it, it, but that's just that's, watching, that's the know. thing is, I mean, he he showed a different aspect um, on his musicianship, and he did that. You know, same for um, the other mo- movie you mentioned, Gone um, Girl. Huh? Gone Girl? Gone Girl, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. again, very subtle and, and, and kind, of, has, kind of thing to it. And he's done other things. He has a band with his wife that is yeah. Nine Inch Nails. Yeah, <laughs> like but it, see, the thing is, that sounds... I've heard some of their stuff. Nine Inch it's kind, it's kind of close to it. But yeah, that's the thing. is, It's it's a different sound. But he did you know, show a different in versatility in doing that and not, um, like, you know... Giving fans, it didn't with something package to, the exact same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, but he he didn't give fans something to be pissed off on it as a Nine Inch Nails album. It was like, oh, Trent Reznor did this, and then here's Nine Inch Nails. You know, two it's, separate. It, it complete, remains its own entity. Yeah, complete separate entities, and so that's the one thing I think he, as some musicians, will do, and get away with it. And some were just too stuck. They're like, no, this is the band. We're going to do this sound now. And it's like, yeah, no, completely different than what your normal stuff is. Don't do it. Well, like if you go going into um, just completely different uh, artist, mm-hmm. um, as I lay dying, you know, they're really heavy, heavy stuff. And then they did the, uh, well, not the, the singer actually did an off thing, his own thing, which is still heavy, but it's more of a comical thing is the, the Austrian death metal or whatever, which is, uh, aren't, you know, Making fun of Arnold Schwarzenegger, just Arnold Schwarzenegger and impersonation. Through yeah, and so it's a whole different thing, and it's not like, oh no, this is as I lay dying, doing this. It's mm-hmm. no, they're their own entity. It's the same sound because I mean, he's not going to go from like heavy to like pop music. Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, there is. Uh, you can also see like uh, there are times when uh, fans are more accepting, like when the members of Slipknot went out and did a Stunts Hour. And yeah, all they did a different sound too. Then Slipknot. And then yeah, but it's not all think, a Slipknot, but yeah. It's not all a Slipknot, but okay. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand it. The fans of Slipknot 
kind of accepted it, but I think the part of the reason like it wasn't uh, introduced to them as okay, this is Slipknot now doing this. Yeah, it was very much made clear. Yeah, it's Stone Sour. <laughs> like it's its own thing. Like you know, like I'm trying something new here, guys. Yeah, like, it's something different. But but they were accepting of it. Yeah, and but that's the thing is they go well. Why did you guys do it? It's like well, this is the band I was in for the most part. I'm sure before some it was like this is the band that I had before. We got together and did Slipknot. We got different members. This is what we did for Slipknot. This is what we knew what I was doing before we got big and famous or whatever. It's our side projects, things like that, you know. And so, yeah, two, they both made it big. And it's like, oh, that's Stone Sour. It's Slipknot. Masks, no masks, you know. Mm-hmm. But even going into something completely different, um, I actually recently saw a, I guess it was an interview uh, with... Um, Oh, what the hell is his name? Darius, whatever. Uh, Hootie and the Blowfish. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was talking about it. It was like, oh, yeah. You know, as with, I was selling out arenas with Hootie and the Blowfish. You know, with Hootie, as he said it. You know, and doing stuff. And then when he went into his new genre, his doing as a solo act or whatever, being country, he was like, yeah, I, would, I would remember um, selling out a, sh- a show and then, you know, the, you know, my very last show was with a hundred thousand fans. And the next day I did a show. It was in a bar. You know, it was myself and it was a whole different experience. It's something, you know, that I hadn't seen or felt in a long time. And it was, you know, renewing and it was energizing and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And he started from the bottom and he was appreciative of the fact that it was a whole different sound. No one expected him to sound like Hootie and the Blowfish. You know, because that's a completely different sound from whatever the hell genre they were. I guess alternative. <laughs> and, Mellow and frat, country. Mellow frat boy. Yeah, rock. and country. And it's a completely different sound. But he was he was talking about that. You know, it was like you know, two different things. And he wanted it to be known as like, I'm not this one. I'm Darius. You know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Country singer. And he was, you know, was talking about that. And he was saying that he remember going on one tour where it was a bigger tour. And he was he was the opening act, you know. It was like I just sold this place out three months ago with Hootie, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> so that's funny. He does like a twenty thirty minute set when he was doing like an hour and a half two hour set like three months ago. And so that's the thing is two different sounds, two different feels in, the, in that sense. And and the fans of Hootie and Blowfish aren't probably as fans as the country singers, but the same vice versa. You know, country singer country music yeah, aren't really a fan of Hootie and Blowfish. Too. But that's the thing is he didn't try to mesh them to all together. So I don't know. It's just a little off tangent, but that's just something I thought was yeah, kind of cool. Yeah, kept, <laughs> kept his two hats separate. Yeah, but I think that's just something kind of cool. But yeah, so going, you know, that's kind of what Trent Reznor did with this, you know, music, you know, sound stuff and then what, or his movies, scores, well, and I his, think he a, just his actual of, band. And in that sense, it's not that he's selling out. Crowds for yeah, I don't think he's going out there still, like performing. Yeah, but, but still, I mean, that's the thing is he's kept it. Thing. He's kept that same sound going through for Nine Inch Nails, but it shows his versatility for you know what else he can do. And then he's also done multiple things with other artists, just as Trent Reznor, you know, yeah. kind of collaborating. Well, I think like it's still Nine Inch Nails will always be his main vehicle. Oh yeah, and it will always be the one that he's probably most guarded about, and the one that he's going to put most of his focus on. You know, even though I know there was a period of time when he, you know, like when he had all these issues when he was talking about like maybe Nine Inch Nails needs to go away for a while. Yeah. And like, and that's when he was probably just moving away from it, but then he got back into it because in in many ways, Nine Inch Nails says become synonymous with his name. And it is synonymous with his name. Yeah. But I, mean, I think that's another thing is a lot of people. It will be his legacy. Yeah. But I think that's a, the thing is a lot of people expect a lot from musicians that they adore. Doesn't matter if you know, it doesn't have to be Nine Inch Nails or Trent Reznor. I mean, anything. You know, they'll they'll get to a certain thing that they expect something, and then when they, you know, don't produce something, they start you know falling out of their or the mind, or you know, they start getting haggled or whatever. It's like, oh well, these guys are you know not doing anything else. Did they break up? Did they do this? It's like, no, we're just taking a break. <laughs> we need to do our own thing. We have families. We have whatever. And that's the thing is sometimes yeah the stress is gonna get to you and. I think that's why Trent did that as well. It was like, well, you know, it may not exist anymore because kind of need a break. Right. Yeah. And, but also in today's one-click 
digital world. Oh, yeah. If you're away for too long, you will be forgotten. I mean, it's the same fear Elvis had in the 50s when he went to do his military service. Yeah. It's the same fear that you should have now, except at a much larger scale because there's oh, yeah. so many, so, oh, yeah, so yeah. many artists waiting, just waiting to take your spot. I mean, and th- and that's, Especially if you're on top. And that's the thing is it's not even that if you're gone for too long, it's, you know, the spotlight kind of shifts slightly and you're not following the spotlight, you're going to fall out of your thing. Like Papa Roach, unless you're a really big fan of Papa Roach, no one hears about them. I didn't even think they were still active, and then until I came across but that's still a video, still and, and, and I was like, "Oh, heck, they're still around." Limp Biscuit, apparently, they're still doing some stuff. Yeah, apparently, yeah, they're, they're still around, but, uh, <laughs> and they have been around. But like, yeah, so like, they have cool. a, and there's a fan base, obviously. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, what, what the, what the hell? But it's fizzled. <laughs> it's, it's, like it's, yeah. even like there's still boy bands around, but oh, you yeah. don't. They're not as heavily advertised as they were in the mid to late nineties. Yeah, yeah. Like, but that's the thing is, I mean, if you're not following the spotlight. Shifted. By you know changing the sound or whatever, you're gonna be unknown pretty quickly, and yeah, that's and the thing is it, it is a risky thing for an artist to say, you know what, maybe we should just stop for a bit, you know. Yeah, but sometimes it's for your own health. Oh yeah, <laughs> you gotta do oh it. yeah. Like it might it be nicer to uh, breathe the same air as everybody else, as opposed to like up when you're up in the stratosphere that high, the yeah. air gets a little thin. Oh yeah, <laughs> and you might. We so detached from everybody else. You're not thinking straight. Yeah, so which which, which uh, it's good to which now. puts me into a, a different statement because you know I haven't mentioned them yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get your glasses mm-hmm. ready. Get your glasses yeah. ready, people. Because you know, <laughs> speaking of someone too high in the stratosphere, because you know he's a dumbass, freaking our president, Mister Dumbass Trump. How much longer are we gonna have to stand with this you guy for until he freaking gets impeached? It's been proven multiple <laughs> times. He has ties to Russia. All, you know, there's his uh, campaign manager has been found guilty for, you know, getting information from Russia, which should put him in prison, which should put him straight into prison. And yet Trump's trying to not deny everything. That dude should just be impeached. We need him out of the damn freaking office. Put the other guy in there. I don't care. I'm not afraid Pence. of that guy. Depends. I'm not afraid of him. I'm not afraid of Trump either. But still, I'm terrified in a sense for Trump because he's an idiot and he'll press the damn button to kill us all. And Pence, he'll probably think about it a little bit. <laughs> you know, so you need to get all him right. freaking out of there. Clearly, you're just trying a cuck trying to take away attention from crooked Hillary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> a typical response. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look, I had my 10-minute rant against Trump the, a few weeks yeah. ago in the last episode we had, so I'm not going to repeat. Go listen to that if you want to hear my opinions yeah. on him. Yeah, just... Uh, uh, you gave it a one-year timeline. You you have until January. Yes, I know. Or, or you're going to have to this, eat crow. This this dumbass should be gone already. I'm I'm just, I'm just dumbfounded the fact that he hasn't been impeached yet. I mean, even if he gets impeached, yes, he may still remain in office. Yeah, impeachment but, isn't a removal. Yeah, he may still a, remain in office, but hopefully when he gets impeached, he'll be so damn embarrassed, he'll like, leave. You think Trump his own knows damn accord. shame? You think Trump knows shame? No, but still, I mean, <laughs> something, come on. He's, he's just, ah. Oh. He doesn't want to mean it. I mean, talk about like, he was born up on that stress for you. Yeah. The air he's been breathing has been so thin, his brain is under the vault. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't, he's Damn. not. <laughs> freaking chimpanzee. He doesn't. Given name. Freaking. Lobotomized. Yeah. Chimpanzee. He does not register things the way. He, he gives a bad name to anybody else. <laughs> As a, look, no one wants a redhead president more than I do. <laughs> yeah. He, he's not redheaded. He's orange, but still. It give, gives all us gingers a bad name. Yeah. But anyway. He's ginger skinned. <laughs> but yeah, anyways. Okay, so we we come full circle on the drinking game. All of you took your shots. <laughs> <laughs> you, went in, you got Metallica and you got in there. I mean, uh, just, you know, I guess closing words uh, on Tread Reznor, even though I think I've already given mine. I I think that as far as like one day music goes, he's already left. Like even if he stopped doing anything now, he's already left his mark. Oh yeah, and he, his legacy is pretty damn secure. I I'm hoping he still sort of comes up with music for yeah. the, as long as he can. I mean, yeah, Ozzy yeah, Osbourne yeah. is in the seventies and he barely now declared <laughs> that he's going to retirement again for the eighth time. Yes, yes, but well, yes, he'll still be around here and there. Yeah, I mean that he he's still kicking, so I'm sure he's still going to be going. You know, he, he, he hasn't, uh, left like some other musicians who have, uh, 
died off on us. But you know, he, he's 2017 is still still going on, buddy. Yeah, the no. graveyard of the the year that was like the graveyard for all musicians. Yeah, oh, well, <laughs> like, a lot of great ones have passed. Starting in January, <laughs> going all the way down. It seemed like for a few weeks, it was like, who's dead now? Yeah, that's what they, I don't know. But anyways, but yeah, <laughs> that's that's the closing thoughts, I guess. All right, closing thoughts on Trent. All right, we'll catch you guys next time. All right, guys. Bye. See you.